Hi, welcome back to part two of the Flying Focus Video Bus 6 Bus Anniversary. I'm PC Perry, Flying Focus Video Collective. And we've been showing Flying Focus Video Bus at this time slot for six years as of November 1997. Before I turn the camera over to other folks, I want to talk a little bit about what I've been doing this year. Um, not much producing, but a lot of videotaping, showing other people how to script, um, many meetings, uh, helping to set policies, and um, logging. It's been busy. We'll try it again next year. One of the events I taped uh, was the Pecoon Farm Workers Boycott Anniversary Program, which uh, was also taped and eventually turned into a program by Joe Weiner. The show that Joe produced was called Justice for Farm Workers, and it showcased highlights from the September 1997 event at Ainsworth Church of Christ. Pecoon was celebrating its support from the community in its five-year boycott against Norpac a food distribution company which buys food from owners who exploit their workers. Norpac, dis Norpac distributes the brand names of Saniam, Flavor Pack, and Garden Burger. So here are clips from the people who came to speak and some of the music you would have heard had you been at the event. Today is the 16th of September, and uh, if you're Mexican, you know what that means. Um, today's the Grito, the Grito de Dolores, and it was when uh, Father uh, Miguel Hidalgo shouted the, or gave the shout for independence. We're not talking about the Emiliano Zapata part later in the early 1900s. It was back earlier in the 1800s, and we're not going to talk a lot about it because we don't have time today, but it, it represented Mexico's independence from Spain. And I thought it was fitting that today, as we're in a church, it was Miguel Hidalgo, Father Miguel Hidalgo, who really gave that shout for freedom. Um, and what we're hoping today is that people who come today not only reminisce on how they've supported and the different churches they've supported us through, but what that grito really meant and what it still means today. And I urge you to try to recapture some of that spirit tonight. And wherever you go forth, we're asking you to, to will or, or take with you that grito and go out and, and talk uh, about the boycott. As to the why, why, why do we support Pekun? Um, we support Pekun because it's right. We support Pekun because we are a coalition of unions and community-based organizations, and we like to have fun. We like to do actions, and and we like to do what we feel in our heart is right. Um, I have got one of the greatest group of folks at Jobs with Justice. For someone coming out of hotels, being a low-wage worker my whole life, um, I'm sitting in this church thinking, most of all, the only thing I ever had in life was hope. And I got that through some spirituality, through some church that I went to, through through some kind word somebody gave me. <laughs> Hi, my name is Hyung Nam. Um, I've had a chance to work with Flying Focus a little bit this year. And um, just wanted to say it's been a pleasure working with Flying Focus. Um, we're definitely the local alternative to the media monopoly. And um, this is one way that we can have democracy in the media. Um, the show that um, I had a chance to work on this year um, was taped by a volunteer. And um, I just worked on producing and editing it. Um, and it was a show um, sponsored by East Town, East Timor Action Network. And um, author, activist, founder of um, human rights and the um, human rights group for Indonesia, TAPL, 
and ex-political prisoner from Indonesia, um, Carmel Budiarjo, was here talking about um, struggle for human rights and democracy in Indonesia, um, oppression in, in Indonesia, um, issues of um, workers and global sweatshops in Indonesia, and um, also human rights violations and struggle for autonomy in East Timor, and also highlighting um, the recent Nobel Peace Prize awards to two of the activists from East Timor. Um, so let's take a look at some of the clips from this um, event. But I really want to say something about East Timor because of course what has happened recently with East Timor is very, very exciting indeed. So I would like to start with that uh, decision of the Nobel Peace Committee to give the Nobel Prize this year to two, the two great uh, two, uh, East Timor uh, figures, uh, Bishop Bello, the head of the in, uh, East Timorese Catholic Church, and uh, Jose Ramos Popa, who is the external leader, the external leader, not the internal leader, the external leader of the uh, National Resistance Council, CNRM. This, of course, is a huge and has been greatly celebrated by Timorese throughout the world, in Portugal, in Australia, and also by all of us who've been working uh, year in and year out to uh, try to convince the world community that East Timor has a just claim to self-determination. And he said also, he used this expression, uh, we are dying as a nation. Now, of course, the significance of that is that so many hundreds of thousands of people have been killed in East Timor. I mean, uh, up to the end of the 70s, uh, it was clear up about 200,000 people were killed in East Timor, which is one third of the population. Uh, so this is the kind of suffering that East Timor has has gone through under the Indonesian occupation. So the, the use of these words, we are dying as a nation, really uh, rang absolutely true. That is what has happened in East Timor because, it, because of the act of genocide that they have been uh, subjected to uh, since the occupation started in late 1975. And of course, the Nobel Peace Committee has made it very clear that it recognizes that Indonesia lives under, uh, East Timor lives under oppression because of the Indonesian occupation, and that there is need for an act of self-determination. And these two men, uh, who they have, uh, uh, what is it, given, they've decided to give this year's, that, that will happen in December, of course, um, who have, they have decided to give the Nobel Prize to this year uh, are, um, people who have been working very hard for this principle, this basic principle of the right of, of self-determination. Hi, I'm Moss Drake, and uh, I haven't produced much for Flying Focus this year because I've been busy with, uh, well, he was a newborn a year ago, but uh, that's what's great about Flying Focus because I can then help other producers who might drop in to do a show, like uh, this show that we're going to show a clip from by Jerry Ebeltoff, which features Mike Houck from the Portland Audubon Society, and he's talking about um, integrating sustainability with public policy. So let's take a look at that clip, and we'll see what Jerry was up to. How we, how we integrate uh, nature, uh, green nature, in with, with our city and make it a part of our lives. Uh, we've got uh, several people here who are in the thick of it. Um, uh, first up will be Mike House, who is going to be talking about protecting the green infrastructure of the urban city. Uh, there's, there's not an, an urban greening thing that goes on around Portland, I think, that doesn't have Mike's fingerprints on it. Like we, had, we didn't have a clue it was out there on the ground in 1988. So I put up 20000 bucks in Portland Audubon Society to ensure that Bergman Photographic Services in Southeast Portland flew the entire region with color infrared photography because Metro could not enter into a contract and wanted to wait another year because they didn't have the funds allocated. The result was Portland State University, under the direction of Joe here, and his students, uh, Paul Newman, is this Paul? Um, uh, digitized all that information from the color IR photography. Looks like this on the computer, and looks like this on a map. All the remaining natural areas of the four county metropolitan region, the first time in the history of the region. Awesome, awesome uh, material to work from in terms of tracking change through time. 
And in fact, this is the photo outside Forest Park, which is right down here, Sabi Island's right here. Look at this area. This is 1988. This is two years later. Whoa. It's all a logging that occurred in there. So it's a very powerful tool to track change through time. Uh, just to give you a flavor of where we're coming from with this. Uh, the term urban forest is the term that's generally used in this country to talk about the issue of trees and cities. I personally don't like the term. As soon as you say forest, people start thinking, oh yeah, board feet of timber, that sort of thing. <laughs> and that's not what urban forestry is about. It, it, a more appropriate term would probably be urban arboriculture, but it's beyond that as well. It's, it's not exactly uh, either of those. But uh, th this is one of the standard definitions from one of the most widely used texts in the field. So this gives you an idea of what the urban forest is, is, is all about. Uh, when we look down on a city like Portland, we can see an awful lot of the urban forest in a color infrared photograph like this. Uh, there are some efforts underway to try to improve this situation. One is uh, in the Northwest Industrial Neighborhood Association, which is an industrial sanctuary, which is this part of town up in here, basically. They have just initiated a 10-year tree planting plan for street trees. And they plan on planting 100 trees a year for the next 10 years, which, by, based on an inventory that we just did for them this summer, will just about fill up. They, they've got about 1,200 planting spaces, potential planting spaces on the streets there, and they're going to put in over 1,000 trees. Another member who can't be with us tonight is Elizabeth Atley, who's on leave from Flying Focus at the moment. Uh, she did this show that we're going to take a look at next, Carol, Carol Gallagher, America Ground Zero. This uh, has to do with uh, the Nevada test sites in the 50s and 60s and the people who lived near there and were exposed to the radiation during the tests. So let's take a look at it. The people you are about to see are about to tell you the real story of our secret nuclear war. It started in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It went to the Pacific. It came to the United States and stayed in the Pacific to test the hydrogen bombs. And so this is the story of what the Atomic Energy Commission called in its documents that were top secret, a low-use segment of the population. These were people who were used, uh, I never used the word guinea pigs, but they were used in a human nuclear experiment that involved thousands and thousands of people. And I have to tell you that it involved you too, because there are 17 major nuclear weapons production and testing facilities in this country. Hanford is one of them. Hanford is a catastrophe waiting to happen. There are people in the Department of Energy now that actually stay awake at night worrying about it. I can tell you this, I know it's true. I know who those people are. Ken Case uh, enjoyed the title Atomic Cowboy because his job at the test site, one of his jobs in the early days was to herd cattle over the steaming ground zeros shortly after an atomic bomb would be detonated. And what he said was that uh, they got cancer and we got cancer, only they died faster because they were actually eating the contaminated range grasses. This is Martha Bordoli Laird, and she's holding two pictures. You can see a white cloud. It looks like a thunderhead and a little building. On the left, she's holding a picture of the teacher and the children in the one-room schoolhouse, which was that building. And her son and two daughters are there on the, on the left. Martha's two daughters developed uh, severe thyroid problems from the radioactive iodine. They had uh, plastic surgery many times for intramuscular and skin cancers on their face and exposed skin. Uh, her son, Butch, who's in that picture, uh, developed stem cell leukemia and died. She had another son while uh, Butch was dying of leukemia who was born at five months with his body shriveled and wasted from the waist down, blackened, uh, died shortly after birth, and her husband died of lung cancer. Another show which Elizabeth did was Oregon Tribunal on Women's Human Rights, which was inspired by the Beijing Conference of this year. And basically, her show was the summary of the culmination of a 16-day event. And this was the actual tribunal, which she put into a one-hour show. So let's take a look at that. The tribunal is part of a larger campaign called 16 Days of Activism Against Gender Violence, which is being observed in Oregon and around the world. It originated in 1991 at the Center for Women's Global Leadership to break the silence 
on the incredible level of violence experienced by women throughout their lives. Oregon has joined the campaign for the first time this year. The seeds for our participation were sown thousands of miles away in Wairo, China in the fall of 1995, when some of us were privileged to attend the NGO Forum of the Fourth World Conference on Women with 30,000 other women from all over the world. When I was 21, that one of my very best friends, Charles, was comforting me one night after a fight I'd had with my boyfriend. I sobbed in his arms, looking for advice and reassurance from my friend and confidant. Instead, his comforting embrace became an, became an inescapable barricade. His body was everywhere, smothering me. My memory of the rape is hazy, but I am clear that I begged him to stop that there was lots of blood, and that the betrayal was absolute. And I saw my divorce, and during the course of that divorce, my, my son told me about the incident, the sexual abuse that I had had upon him in the I reported it to the court, and began the process of going up to the court with the court. That process ended a year later with me losing custody of my child. The judge said that he said, I'm not going to do this now. He stated that I was in a family with the relationship between this child and his wife. And I was forced to deliver my son to his father the next day. Then I had to listen to my child suffer and hear the message of the abuse and the abuse from my family to do the family. There are not adequate services for young women who are experiencing abuse in their homes at all. They, um, there are not adequate services for young women in prostitution. In fact, a lot of the services out there for women in prostitution um, are for women over 18, and the average age of women going into prostitution is like 13 or 14. Something to actually to share with you guys, and really need to listen real close to this. You have friends. You have loved ones who's going through domestic violence. Don't ever turn your back on that person. In addition to the animal rights shows that I talked about last week, I also did three other shows. And I guess the common theme in these shows is that everyone in them values life more than money, which is a theme that you don't see very often in mainstream television or even any other kind of media. Um, in this first clip, Tim Calvert, who's with Laughing Horse Books and City Bikes, both are worker-owned co-ops, talks a little bit about worker-owned co-ops. You get into this cooperative stuff, this incorporation and laws, it like gets all very technical. Um, but it's also, to me, it's pretty exciting because it represents, for me, one of the few concrete things that we can do uh, that both empowers the people involved and challenges uh, the current economic system. And the thing I most especially appreciate about it is that um, politically, for, for people to have an independent political voice, pretty much if they cannot turn their backs on the big capitalist firms when push comes to shove, they're going to be kind of in their control. And so by forming businesses that are cooperatively run, that don't rely on these big corporations, um, theoretically we can build a political movement out of that that doesn't reference capitalism and exploitation and, and uh, degradation as your kind of basic yardstick, and then everything else happens after that. So. Now in this next clip, Patch Adams, who's a doctor and also a clown, talks about the way he does medicine, which is for fun and for the joy of giving service to other people, not for money. My name is Patch Adams. I am a physician and clown, among many things. I entered medicine 30 years ago to use medicine as a vehicle for social change. I'm actually a social change artist. <laughs> for which medicine and clowning are two of the ways I enacted. In 1971, when I graduated, 20 adults, three of us physicians, and their children moved into a large single-family dwelling, six-bedroom house, and we said we were a hospital. <laughs> Audacious by American standards, but if you've been to the third world hospitals as I have, we look pretty good. 
We are open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for all manner of interest from wellness to profound illness. We never charge money. In fact, it wasn't that we wanted to be free for poor people. We are a political act to recreate community. And we believe that in that sense of community, which is not describing geography, but describing relationship, we can never ever have community again until we give our citizens a sense of belonging. And that is not possible in the business context of medical practice. And so again, it wasn't that we were free for poor people. We were free because we wanted to start community. This last clip is from a music video that I did because I wanted to replace the advertising jingles that kept running through my head with something a little more positive. The sands of time slip away. The hour is near at hand. Someday soon they'll be held to pay if we don't let them understand. Today we decide if the forest stands. So I really want to thank everybody who participated in Flying Focus Video Bus and all of our events and programs this year. Uh, it could never happen without the work of lots and lots of people, including the camera operator tonight, Alan. And uh, we really want to thank all of you for watching, and we hope that if you are watching, you can let us know by giving us a call at 239-7456 or our voicemail at 321-5051. We always appreciate your comments, even if they're negative. And uh, we hope that you can tune in again next week for the Flying Focus video bus. And if you want to get involved, um, please feel free to give us a call because it's just as easy as picking up a camcorder. And many of us never had done that before, but when we started. So thanks a lot for watching and uh, have a good evening.